Okay, we are recording. I am joined today by Sandra Beckerek, who's uh, Associate Professor of Philosophy at Victoria University of Wellington. Uh, thanks so much for joining me today. Hi, um, thank you. Yeah, so we're going to talk about your paper, Street Art and Consent, which is from the British Journal of Aesthetics from, I think, yeah, 2015. Um, and I just want to start off by uh, asking you to just briefly sketch uh, the view that you present. And so, you know, you make this, you know, some really nice distinctions between public art and street art and graffiti. Like those are the three main categories you're looking at. And so could you just briefly like go over those differences? Yeah, so my main idea for thinking about graffiti and street art had to do with this notion of consent. Um, so if you think about art on a kind of continuum, the more consent something has, the closer it looks like public art, the less consent it has, the more it uh, approximates graffiti or street art. There's lots of cases in the middle that are kind of complicated, that's hard to know what to think about. And those cases typically have some consent, but not lots of consent. So think about public murals, they get some consent from some councils, but not others. There might be art also that the community puts up and there's public endorsement kind of consent, but not official consent. Um, so that's kind of one line that um, makes sense a lot of, of my thinking about street art is I, I think about it along the lines of how much consent is there? Um, and that kind of guides my thinking about what things count as street art and what doesn't. Okay, There's great. lots of other qualities too, but <laughs> that's yeah. a big one. And in terms of like the difference between street art and graffiti, right? It's, it's that street art, right? Even if it may look the same as graffiti, right? Typically has the sort of political activist um, in, intention behind it. Whereas graffiti is sort of self-expression. I'm going to put my tag out there so that, you know, other graffitiists can, you know, see my name or I'm marking territory or something of that sort, right? Yeah, so when I think about that difference, I guess it's a little hazier for me because there's a lot of, I mean, I guess a natural intuition to think about that difference between graffiti and street art has to do with whether it's uh, visual uh, imagery or if it's simply words. But of course, there's a lot of street art that's made with words. And conversely, there's a lot of graffiti that is um, visually uses imagery and, and that's um, very beautiful. So that conception doesn't quite cut it for me when I think about that difference. I'm actually think about more the audience that the work is directed towards. Um, a lot of graffiti tends to be um, directed at a particular kind of audience, some other person or um, some other group whereas street art is designed for anybody passing by. So for me, that's a kind of relevant way of cashing out that difference. Um, there are of course, unclear boundaries there. When I go to my local beach, uh, for some reason we have a huge tag that says dogs are great on the dog side. Uh, and I think, hmm, that's like designed for the dog walking community and maybe it's a tag in virtue of that fact, but it's not a tag in virtue of having a particular person it's directed to the way John Loves Tom is directed at a particular audience. Um, so again, who counts as your audience can expand and collapse as well. And maybe the broader the audience, the more it approximates street art and further than that will and less than that will make it look more like graffiti, I guess. Okay, cool. So on, on the case of John Loves Tom, right? That, you know, that's typically, you know, you see stuff like that, you know, someone hearts someone else, right? Or I heart someone on, you know, overpasses and various other places. Um, and that's just self-expression. That seems pretty straightforwardly not street art. It has no activist intent. Um, it's just me expressing my love for whoever I love. Right. Regardless of whether they love me, I love them. Right. And I'm going to proclaim that to 
the world and hopefully they see it or whatever, right? But um, it, there are cases where, or I, you know, I think especially that case of John loves Tom or Adam loves Steve or whatever, where that could be politically activists or at least be conceived as such by those who are viewing it, right? That if that were on a highway overpass in like a deeply conservative county, you know, somewhere in America, right? That, you know, that's an act of provocation, right? That, you know, that love between two men or love between two women uh, is something that's uh, forbidden or something that's taboo. And it seems like, you know, the mere act of putting that, you know, graffiti out there is provocative, um, even if the person doesn't intend it as such, right? Even if it's this, you know, naive, pure expression of love, it could be provocative. And so is that a case where it's sort of in between graffiti and potentially street art because it may have an activist sort of purpose? Yeah, I think so. I, I don't know that I have hard and fast rules around these kinds of qualities. I, I certainly think that um, somebody who, if you're in a really conservative environment and you have an expression of love that you're trying to put out there, I, it's hard to imagine somebody knowingly doing that uh, and also not having a desire for that to be subversive or transgressive in some sense, or to be aware of the risk involved in doing something like that. So I, I guess I, I would think, and I, that kind of speaks to my, I have a pretty open notion of what it takes to be sort of activist or subversive or transgressive. Um, I think even just putting something out there in the streets is a pretty transgressive act. Um, when I think about my own desires to put things on streets, uh, it's a pretty scary experience. Um, and it, that feeling itself is subversive in lots of ways. Um, so it doesn't take much on my view, I guess, to push those boundaries. Um, so yeah, I guess I think that person, one, it's hard to see how he, he, he might be doing that without being aware of the way it would be received. Um, and yeah, I think that reception is part of why you do it. You want it to be received by others. You want other people to know that um, both as an act of self-expression, but also as a recognition of how it will be received and wanting that acknowledgement or validation or reassurance or support. Okay, cool. So even if, uh, so what if though the person is that naive, right? That you just have this naive, person who just wants to express, you know, the, the love of their beloved, it just happens to be a type of love that goes against, you know, local community standards or whatever. In, in that case, would it be street art or, or is the reception the, the thing that's pushing it more in the direction of street art as opposed to mere graffiti? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'd need, um, I guess I'd need to think about that more. I, um, what do I wanna say about that? Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'd need to think more. I think um, the reception, I guess I'm not, I wanna say maybe there's lots of cases where reception doesn't matter. Um, there was once a 24 hour graffiti installation where maybe 10 people were invited and it was held for 24 hours. <laughs> there was still street art there, even though there was almost no reception or very little reception. Um, there's lots of art that gets put out and it might be that the traditional views of the neighborhood are one way but there's a small subgroup in that neighborhood that you're trying to speak to that's no less street art by virtue of being received by this larger community that might not buy into it in the same way that the subgroup does. 
So I guess I'm a little hesitant about having it fixed by the reception side, if only because you can't always predict or know or anticipate. And I guess also you, you often are, by virtue of putting it out there, letting it, you don't know who's gonna be out there, or who's gonna get it or not get it. Uh, and that's part of why you would put it out there rather than in a museum or near your local um, LGBTQ plus community center or something like that. So I guess you could very cluelessly and ignorantly do those things, but then it's not clear to me that you're making much of anything at all. <laughs> Beyond just mere self-expression. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess the more robust those those artistic and, and uh, expressive intentions are, the more closer they will approximate something, but the nature of those intentions then would cash out where they're, what kind of thing it is that they're making, which makes sense if we think that categories of art are kind of fixed by the artist's intentions and you know, you get to have a say of the kind of thing you think you're making um, to the extent that you can carve that out. Um, we should maybe pay attention a little bit to those things and, and that would make sense to predict how it gets received. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's right. I mean, in my experience, my, you know, in teaching your paper and other papers like uh, of this sort, like students always want to go with it, the audience decides, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whereas, you know, most of us in, who are doing aesthetics are like, no, it's the, the artist. Like, why do you think this? Um, but but turning gears or switching gears, um, you know, the a lot of the work on street art uh, is on visual art, right? Uh, it's on murals, it's on graffiti, uh, and, and so forth. Um, there's not much out there that I'm aware of, at least on on music as street art. And so, you know, what I have in mind is busking. Right, and, and I think, you know, there is gonna be a difference between busking that's, on your view, that busking that's street art and busking that's public art, right? Because in some places, you know, in order to busk legally on, on the street or in the subway or whatever, you have to be licensed by, uh, you know, whoever, the local government. Um, and, you know, those buskers have a set location, they can be there at set hours and they can do their thing legally without hassle and it seems like on, on your view because that you know that sort of busker has consent um they're doing public art right yeah. whereas the busker who is unlicensed who's out on the street corner you know hat down playing guitar singing whatever covers they're singing um or i guess original tunes it doesn't have to be covers um that would be much more like street art right because it's a consensual yep yes Awesome. I totally agree. Um, if you think, if you go back to that line of um, sort of continuum of consent, you know, you can get the, the buskers who have to have more permissions to be allowed to do that, that pushes them more towards that public art side. Uh, those who have less tend to be more like the street artists. Uh, there's really interesting things. Uh, one reason I haven't thought or done a lot with music is that I don't know enough about it. <laughs> um, another is though that the ontological kinds of questions about what art is are more in line with music than they are with visual art. So the nature of street art being ephemeral, being able to be vandalized, um, all those things are very contrary to the notion of visual art. And, but music is by its definition ephemeral, you know, it lasts a certain period of time. It can be distorted by the player. Um, so all those things that are normally problematic for visual art in the streets, the being in the streets doesn't impact on how we think about music in the way that it does for visual art. Um, that said, I, definitely think that that continuum explains a lot of the features like it's more risky and a little scarier for somebody to busk in environments where you don't have that option to get permission 
than it is when you do. And if you're in, in a city where you need permission, it's much more scary and risky to opt to not get permission. Um, lots more things can happen to you. You have the right to be fined. You have the you can be put in jail, or you can be you know harassed a lot more, not just by the audience, um, but also by other buskers who may have had consent and gotten permission. So there's a lot of risks that you take on when you're busking without permission in a city where you can get permission. That goes away in a city where you never need permission. If you never need permission, then being one busker versus another, you're kind of on a par. So there you kind of want to say, well, yeah, I have no more equal a say than, than anybody else for being here. And then it really is a kind of power play. Who's the better singer performer who can gather their own audiences and that really then looks a lot like street art. When you think about street art being a competition for visual space, which is the most beautiful, who is going to get the best audience uptake in that neighborhood. Um, so to a busker who is more successful will have those same features that a visual work would have. So you can see that kind of alignment there around those features that garner support, garner appreciation and, and they function very similarly in that respect, I think. Um, yeah, good. And, and I mean, music is especially a consensual, <laughs> right? That rounding a corner, you could just, you're smacked by it, right, sometimes. And, you know, I think that's part of why Kant complains about music, that it's like a really smelly perfume, right? Like you enter the room and it just hits your nostrils and it's there and you can't escape it, right? And I mean, like, it seems like Kant really did not like music. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, but I mean, that's like, I feel like a lot of people react that way when there's someone on the street playing the saxophone or there's, you know, a group of, you know, teenagers on the street, you know, banging um, plastic buckets with drumsticks, right? That it's there, they hate it, they can't escape it, and they hate it because they can't escape it, right? Uh, at least, you know, if they want to be in that space, they have to contend with that and they just can't block it out. Um, yeah. You know, even with earbuds, right? That there it is intruding on us. Yeah. Um, yeah. I couldn't agree more. I think that our whole, and, and that's, I think, part of what the whole inspiration behind sort of the emergence of street art very generally recently has been this recognition that our public spaces have been taken over by commercial interests and private industry interests. And it's this protest of why do you guys get to dictate and fix what I have to experience when I'm out and about? And so all these performers are not, I mean, the teenagers doing this are taking advantage of this um, general attitude that I think we have these days of I've had enough of the McDonald's ads and uh, all these boards of horrible advertising surrounding me, pervading me, um, that this is a, a response to that over commercialization of our public space and an attempt to reclaim that space. Um, whether we're doing that visually with art or auditorily with music and sounds. I mean, think about all the companies that blare music at their entrance, they, they will have that overhang in front of yeah. their store shop and there's the little sound coming out. And I kind of think, yay for the teenager who will take their buckets and drown out all that music. Um, who are they to think that I have to listen to one versus the other? Um, so those are kinds of, sorry, qualities that I think all street art is kind of embracing this rejection of external people trying to tell us what our public environment has to be like or look like. Um, yeah, so to me, those, those stand part and parcel. Um, that this idea that artists could take over the world, I think is really cool right now. That would be great because uh, it would be one less company 
in my face as I walk down the street. And really, I'd much rather see something an artist has to offer, even if it's crap. Um, <laughs> and some of the crap that's in stores that is in my face instead. Yeah, better than the Muzak. Right, <laughs> that's yeah. blaring from the overhang. Right. Um, yeah. Speaking of a consensual auditory phenomena, <laughs> that's perfect. Um, yeah, and I think you know one just minor. It may be just a minor difference between the you know visual street artists and auditory street artists, right? Musicians versus you know spray painters and graffiti artists is that you know, the musician is there, they have the hat, they have the guitar case down and people can throw money in it, right? Whereas with the, you know, someone who's doing their, their visual art with spray paint, there's typically not like a box where you can put, you know, a quarter here, a dollar there, right? Uh, so there is something, I don't know if it's more subverses or less subverses, but they're out there competing with the music, competing with street sounds um, and, you know, trying to scrap you know, just or scrape by on just, you know, a few dollars here and there. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't know how to explain that, but I guess I have this desire to say, oh, well, some, you know, when street artists work, there's always some kind of signature style that's visual that is repeated across their work, um, which is a, another really interesting phenomenon about street art that no one's really written about, um, such that their work is recognizable not by artists um, writing their name at the bottom, but they have a visual signature that is repeatable and re-identifiable. And music doesn't get that because of its ephemerality. Um, and, and this is another kind of big difference with street art that's visual if it really does stand the test of time, then you really do see it over and over again, and it can become ingrained in your mind and you can figure out how to find it in a way that music really doesn't get that benefit to, to street music that visual arts have. A, a further component of that is um, the way that street art visually is documented there's not enough written about the documentation of street art, but a lot of street art is documented online in lots of venues that enables it to have a, a life after having been seen in the street, um, such that it's easy to track down lots of street artists to commission them to do all sorts of things, which people do. Um, and again, the poor musician doesn't get those things. So I'm all for the musician with the hat because they, the, the street doesn't afford them a lot of these opportunities that street art is uh, able to afford visual artists. Yeah, that, that's true. And one, one thought I had going back to your point about how, uh, you know, buskers like help us reimagine a world where art has taken over, artists can take over. I feel like part of that is going to be we're out here scraping a living, right? But this is one way of making a living. One option is to work in the Starbucks over there. Yeah. right for 725 an hour right uh you know hating yourself in the process perhaps or you could be out here risking harassment possibly from the police right and i've seen police officers chasing young you know black kids in chicago who are busking right chasing them down the street and basically they go two blocks down one block over and reset up for half hour an hour um, but that's one way of making a living that's an alternative to the the capitalist system that's being represented everywhere behind us yeah yeah i totally agree um garden bombing and mm -hmm. seed bombing yarn bombing they're all ways of reimagining that society um and inviting us to question why why are we living like this what does this gain for us um, and, yeah, and, and why are advertisements legitimate, but what we're not doing or what we're doing is not legitimate, right? Or why is Muzak legitimate, but what we're doing is not legitimate? Yeah, yeah. So there's a, and I guess maybe that's a larger notion of subversion or transgressive values that underwrites all forms of street art, whether you're doing it intentionally or not, or consciously or not, 
um, just that very act is an act to, to show other people you, there are other alternatives and I, I'm going to pursue that. Um, and it does, I would like to think, make you question, what am I doing <laughs> in this world? And is this really how I want to live? And do I want my world that I live in? What kind of world do I want to live in? And what role can I play in changing that world? And maybe you can't give up your day job, but you can go plant some nice flowers or some herbs or some tomatoes in the side street. Um, or you can make something nice. I'm part of a jewelry group that as its exhibition show does a jewelry drop um, during the art show. So for a week, we do these little drops of jewelry and there's something cool about giving away jewelry for free <laughs> that totally undermines all of our concepts of what jewelry is supposed to be, where you find it, how you acquire it, the kind of person that you need to be to own it. <laughs> so I think that subversion, however it gets cashed out in, in the real world, is really important to something being street art. And, and that seems to have something to do with doing it when you're not supposed to, or when other people, whoever those other people are, don't want you to. <laughs> yeah, right. And, and on that point, just to, I think, close, uh, close out the discussion, are flash mobs um, subversive in the right way, right? It seems like initially they may have been, but perhaps over time they've just become too cliche or they had their moment and now they're sort of lame or something like that. I don't know, do you have thoughts about flash mobs? <laughs> I confess being down here in New Zealand, I, I don't think I've had enough exposure to flash mobs to have had that experience wane. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too culturally distanced, perhaps. Um, yeah, I don't. I I I don't know. I I think you could make the same argument for street art. Um, a lot of apartment buildings put street art commission artists to put street art on their buildings. Um, maybe that's just as lame as a flash mob advertising something. Um, yeah. Maybe it depends on what the flash mob is advertising or why or how they come to be coming together to do what they're doing. It's all about how you do your work. I think that's really important to that question of whether it's a consensual, because um, that really does speak to the process of art making. Um, there's a facet of art making for street art um, of all kinds that is about this undermining of authority. And that is about the process of art. How do you make it? And that, that part seems important. And I guess I'd say the same thing about the flash mob, whether it's um, transgressive in the right way depends really on how, what, what's going on. You wanna hear more about the story, who's yeah. doing it, why are they doing it? What, what is their point and goal? <laughs> yeah. Awesome, well, thank you so much. Sandra, I really appreciate your time. Yeah, this was so much fun. Thank you for having me. Thanks.